We are up to mitzvah number 80, and today we're going to do mitzvah number 80, and 540, and 541. And this is a mitzvah that deals with what happens when you encounter your friend, and they're walking with their animal, and their animal either is suffering under a burden, under a load. Alternatively, the animal needs to be loaded, and then there's a mitzvah for you to not ignore your friend, to help him, to help him load the animal, to help him unload the animal. So mitzvah number 80 is the positive mitzvah to help your friend unload the animal. Mitzvah number 540 is to not ignore your friend, meaning this is the negative, the prohibition, to not ignore your friend whose animal needs to be helped. And finally, mitzvah number 541 is to help your friend load the animal. So 80 is to unload the animal, and there's a separate mitzvah to load the animal. And Adjacent to this entire discussion is the broader discussion of how the Torah mandates that we must treat animals, and we're going to talk about that at the very end. Okay, so mitzvah number 80 is the mitzvah to remove or to help your friend remove from upon their animal a load, a burden, when the animal is struggling to maintain the load. Now, the way this is framed in the verse in chapter 23 of the book of Exodus is when you see the donkey of the person you hate struggling with the load, you help the friend of yours or the enemy of yours even remove the load and resituate it, reposition it, rebalance it so that the person can continue their journey. Now, the Sefer HaChinuch, the book that we're using to guide us through the mitzvahs, he takes a pause and says, wait a minute, the verse frames this as you helping your enemy. Are you allowed to have enemies? Aren't we supposed to love everyone? And this is specifically referring to another Jew. Are you allowed to hate a fellow Jew? So he tells us a side point that there's actually an instance where you are allowed to hate a fellow Jew. Namely, quotes the Talmud. Talmud says that if you see a fellow Jew doing a sin in private and you warn them, and you try to encourage them to repent, and the person is resistant to repenting, in such an instance, you are allowed to hate a fellow Jew. And perhaps when the verse is talking about a person who has an animal who's struggling, and it's a person that you hate, maybe it's referring to a person that you are legally allowed to hate. Alternatively, it could also be referring to someone that you just don't like. You know, people that we like, people we get along with, people we're friendly with, people who are our close associates and acquaintances, people that we like. And then there's some people we just don't get along with them. We don't like them, not because of any technical halachic reason. We just are not friends with them. We dislike their personality. Something about them is irksome to us. It happens. Not everyone loves everyone naturally. And perhaps the verse is referring to that. Regardless, you have to help an individual in need unload their animal. And the verse talks about a donkey, but of course this refers to any animal. If you have a different kind of animal, a mule, a bovine of sorts, any animal that is struggling with a load, that too would be included in this mitzvah. And the reason why the Torah uses the example of a donkey, because that is what is used to transport cargo. Now, the reason for this mitzvah, I think, is, is quite obvious. We, of course, are here to perfect ourselves, to improve ourselves, to develop good character, to polish up our personality. We're born, we have a collection of good characteristics and bad characteristics. Some parts of us are really admirable, good quality, sterling character. And of course, all of us have things that we need to fix. If we didn't have that, if we were perfect, we would be an angel and we would not be a human and our life would have no purpose. It's the pursuit of greatness. It's the pursuit of perfection. That's why we're here. We call that, of course, free will, meaning that the human is positioned to have options, to have choices, to have different avenues, different paths you could take, one path towards self-perfection, really strengthening and buttressing the good characteristics that you have naturally and trying to fix, trying to remedy the bad characteristics that you have and steadily improve yourself and make yourself into an angel. 
becomes someone of complete sterling character. That's option A, the advisable one. And of course, we have the other option, and that is to allow our good character to lapse, to allow the eight Sahara inclination to cause us to lose the good characteristics we have, and the bad characteristics, not only we don't fix them, but they become further and further entrenched. And thus, a person can choose to become way worse than they were at the onset of their life, and that's why we're here. And that's the dynamic that the Almighty desired, and that's why he created the world, to make it an arena for free will to operate. The Almighty removes himself from humanity to a certain extent. The exact extent of that, of course, is a very important and advanced question. The Almighty removes himself, so to speak, and how that works is a very Kabbalistic question. But the Almighty frees up man to make choices. And the Torah is there as our greatest aid, as our greatest companion to enable us to choose kindness and benevolence and goodness and righteousness and piety. It's there to nudge us down the path to become an angel, down the path of character perfection, and to avoid the pitfalls and the dangers of the Sahara. And here we see a classic example. You're going, you're busy, you're driving to work, you have a, an important meeting, and you see your friend who's suffering. And your instinct is, uh, let me ignore that. Let me look away. I didn't see that. After all, we have places to go, people to meet, things to do. And the Torah is telling us, no, stop what you're doing. Notice the pain of your friend. Empathize with them. Try to help solve their problem. That's the mitzvah. And that is an example of the Torah telling us of creating a framework wherein we will develop good character, we will fix bad character, and we will go along the path of character perfection. You're driving along the road and you see someone else with a flat tire. And this is before the day of AAA or calling up Geico, roadside assistance. And you have a jack in the back of your car and you know how to do it, but it's going to take 10 minutes out of your day. What do you do? It's our instinct. The Yetzirah's preferred approach is ignore it. Drive by what's the... Well, you, you can't be blamed after all. You're not a bad person if you do that. Everyone would do it. Most people would do that. Here's the mitzvah. Stop, notice, go help. And the Sefer Chinuch tells us that this, of course, mitzvah is framed as helping your friend load and unload his animal. But of course, this would apply to someone who is themselves suffering physically. If you have to help your friend when his animal is suffering physically, certainly when someone themselves physically is suffering, you must do what you can to go aid them and assist them. And included in this, says the Sefer HaChinuch, is having mercy and empathizing with someone who is distraught about a lost item. Have you ever seen this? Someone going mad, looking for their phone or their keys? Oh, missing the right shoe. Have you seen that? You have one shoe, not the other. If you you don't have both, it's fine. Because you assume they're together. You have one. There's a certain kind of diabolical pain of finding one shoe, not the other. So you see someone going crazy like a madman looking for their stuff. In this mitzvah, we're told to empathize with them. Go help them look for it. It is a mitzvah, or included in this mitzvah, in the Torah. Moreover, this mitzvah is framed as helping the animal. The animal's in pain. This is one of the biggest sources for the concept of what's called tsa'ar ba'alei chayim, the pain of living things. It is a mitzvah to prevent an animal from being pained. And thus, when you unload the burden of the animal, animal suffering, you are preventing the animal from being pained. And this is part of a much broader discussion that we'll talk about, please God, that a person is not allowed to cause unnecessary pain to an animal and must do whatever a person can to make the animal's pain go away. So like we said, there's a mitzvah to help your friend unload the animal. There is an additional prohibition to not ignore your friend when you see him along the way. Don't leave him there at the side. 
and go on your um, on your way, just to continue your journey. Rather, you stop and go help them. So that's two mitzvahs. If someone does ignore their friend, they have violated a prohibition, and they've also ignored a positive mitzvah. And finally, we have the third mitzvah, and that is 541, and that's to help your friend load the animal, not only to unload the animal, which of course is accomplishing multiple goals, both helping your friend and helping the animal, but also when it comes to loading the animal, that too is a separate stand-alone mitzvah. Now I want to go through some of the interesting laws related to these mitzvahs, and then we'll talk more about the general idea of not causing pain to animals. So the Talmud tells us something interesting. The Talmud tells us that are you allowed to charge for your services? And the Talmud says that when it comes to loading the animal, then you're allowed to charge for your services. So even though you were required to go help them, after all, you could have been working at your job. You could have been building your widgets. You could have been doing your services. You should get paid for that. So yes, it's a mitzvah, but it doesn't mean that you have to forfeit your income. Whereas when it comes to removing the burden from the animal, in that instance, you must do it for free. You cannot charge for your services. And the commentaries explain that when you're unloading the animal, you're also relieving the pain of the animal. And therefore, you should do it for free. Whereas when you're loading the animal, that is just a service to your friend. The animal's not benefiting. Therefore, you're, do, you're providing a service to your friend. Yes, you are obligated to provide the service, but he is obligated to pay in the event that you insist on getting paid. Now, what do you do if you're driving along the way and you see not one animal, but two animals? One on the right side of the street, one on the left side of the street. Both of them need to be helped. One of the animals has a big load and is struggling with the load, and the load needs to be removed. The other animal has no load at all, but the person has the cargo and needs help to load the animal. Which one of those two must you do first? So again, you have two mitzvos to load and to unload the animal. Which one has priority? Says the Talmud, you must unload the animal that needs to be unloaded before you load the animal that needs to be loaded. Why? The answer is obvious, because by unloading the animal, you're also relieving the pain of the animal. And we're told that we must do whatever we can to not cause pain to the animals. And therefore, when it comes to unloading the animal, you have two mitzvahs, essentially, to help your friend and to relieve the pain of the animal, and therefore takes precedence over the mitzvah of loading the animal. So again, you're driving by, you see two cases, you unload first, and then you help your other friend load. And then the Talmud says something really fascinating. Fascinating and counterintuitive, but also very illuminating. Suppose you are going along the way, and you see two animals. One animal needs to be loaded one animal needs to be unloaded. So you told me, well, we have to unload first and then load. But there's another variable here. The person that owns the animal who needs to be loaded is someone that you can't stand. You hate their guts. Someone that you hate. And the person whose animal needs to be unloaded is your friend, is your chum, is your buddy. Who comes first? So we would think, well, I have my buddy and his animal needs to be unloaded and you always unload before you load. So most certainly you help your buddy unload his animal. That's what we would think. Says the Talmud, no. In in an instance where it's your enemy whose animal needs to be loaded, that comes before helping your friend unload his animal. And the reason, says the Talmud, because even though you have the priority of unloading over loading, because when you unload, you help your friend and you help the animal, 
but there's another factor here. And that is that the primary objective of all mitzvos is to suppress the Yetzirah is to fight and resist against the Yetzahara. That is the primary objective of mitzvahs. And when you see your friend, you want to help him. And when you see your enemy, you want him to suffer. Let him suffer. Let him work hard. And that is the Yetzahara speaking. The Yetzahara, his job is to keep separation Separate man from his mission. Separate man from his fellow. Separate man from God. And the fact that there is one person who hates another person, the Yetzirah is really happy about that. And he wants to do whatever he can to perpetuate that. And when you go and you see someone who you don't like so much, you really can't stand them. But they need help. And you say, I'm going to come help you now when you need it. You are mending a broken relationship. You are taking one step, one gesture towards the person that you don't stand. And you know what? Maybe tomorrow the person will reciprocate. And you know what you'll say? It's not such a bad guy. Maybe there's something redeeming about them. The act of a person helping someone they don't like is an act that's there to suppress the eight Sahara and to improve the relationship between these two people. And therefore, even though relative to the kind of the, the act itself, it's better to help the animal being unloaded than the animal being loaded. In this instance, it's different. There's another big variable, the biggest variable of them all, suppressing the eight Sahara, mending broken relationships, and therefore you help your enemy load his animal ahead of your friend unload his animal. And I think that this really sheds light on what the objective of mitzvahs is. Mitzvahs are there, like we said. The Torah mitzvahs are there to make us into angels. Why are we not angels? After all, our soul, our sages tell us, is loftier than angels. So not only we should be angels, we should be even greater than angels. After all, we have a loftier soul than the angels. And the only reason why we're not so holy and so lofty and so spiritual and so beautiful, it's because of the Yetzirah. And therefore, the primary objective of Mitzos is to fend off the Yetzirah, to repulse its incursions upon man. And therefore, that always takes priority. Help your enemy load his animal ahead of helping your buddy unload his. I think this gives us a new framework of understanding what mitzvahs really are there to do broadly. Now, some more laws about this mitzvah. You don't need to go out of your way, per se, to go help your friends. You don't need to drive along the highway to see who needs to have their tire fixed. If you see a friend at a distance who needs help, you have to go but up to a certain point. The Talmud says it's seven and a half mil. But more than that, you could if you want, you're not obligated. Now, what about the following case? Suppose you are a Kohen. A male Kohen is barred from entering a cemetery. You see your friend, you are a Kohen, you see your friend in a cemetery with an animal that's collapsed under a massive load, are you allowed to enter the cemetery to go help your friend? And the answer is no. Why? Because you cannot violate one mitzvah to fulfill a different mitzvah. Under certain circumstances, maybe you would say that the mitzvah that you're going to do takes precedence over the mitzvah you're going to violate, but in this instance, you would not be obligated to do that. Another example, suppose you are an older, dignified person, and it's not fitting for your stature and dignity to go lift cargo and move cargo and maneuver cargo and pull stuff up from the animal. and on. It's just not, you're a more distinguished person. So the Talmud says that you would not be obligated to go help your friend 
if you yourself would not do that to your animal, meaning if you're someone who's so dignified, you're not going to deal with the animals. If you're an older person, you're a more dignified person, distinguished person. If you wouldn't load and unload your own animals, you are not obligated to go load and unload your friend's animals. Nevertheless, if you decide out of the goodness of your heart to go above and beyond the call of duty, and you say, you know what, even though by the letter of the law, I am not obligated to go load and unload my friend, my, my fellow's animal because I'm so dignified, but I want to do it anyhow because it's a mitzvah, then that's a beautiful thing. You would be blessed as a result even though it's not obligatory. The Talmud in the book of Bab Metzia, page 30b, tells us a wonderful story to this effect. It tells us of a great sage, Rabbi Yishmael, the son of Rabbi Yossi, he was walking along the road. And he sees a man carrying a bunch of logs of wood on their back. And the person is schlepping it and sweating profusely. And then he takes a little rest along the way. And he collapses on the floor and drops the wood and drops the sticks. And he's relaxing, you know, catching his breath before he keeps on going on his journey. And now it's time for him to get up and to continue his journey. So he tells the great venerated sage... Would you give me a boost here? Would you lift these logs on my back? So the rabbi says to him, here, here's what we'll do here. How much do these things cost? What's the value of these logs? He tells him it's a half a diner. Half of a diner, a gold coin. She says, listen, I'll give you half a diner, but I'm not going to help you with the logs. I'll pay for it. So we'll just leave the logs over here. I'll pay for it, and then you'll have your profit, but don't make me lift them. It's not, it's beneath my dignity. So the man says, sure, it's a deal. So he gives him the half dinner coin. And then he says, okay, now I've acquired those lodge, right? The rabbis acquired, acquired those, those lodge. So he says, now I hereby declare that these lodge are hefker. They're hefker. They're ownerless. So whoever wants to come could come and grab them. I bought them from you, and now I'm leaving them on the side of the road. So this guy, this uh, enterprising individual says, ah, it's ownerless. He quickly grabs it. He says, now it's mine again. So he tells the rabbi, uh, I have another request. Could you help me put these lodges back on my back? So he says, uh, here's a half dinner. So he gives him another half dinner, and he declares it ownerless. And the man grabs it again a third time. And The rabbi says, I declare it ownerless to everyone in the world except you. (laughs) I'm not going through this uh, rigmarole again. That's the Talmud. And the Talmud concludes that the great sage did not need to tend to it. The great sage could have said, I'm sorry, I'm not obligated to do it because it's beneath my dignity. But he decided out of the goodness of his heart to go help the person and give him the compensation instead of the actual physical labor. And the Thomas says, well, he acted above and beyond the letter of the law. Even though he could have said, sorry, I'm not helping you. I don't need to pay you for anything. He was very righteous and he helped the person nonetheless, even though he didn't actually help him with the physical labor. Now, what about if we're dealing with a regular person? So you're helping your neighbor, neighbor's trying to load and unload the animal, and you load it, and it turns out it's not the right load, you have to unload it. How many times are you obligated to help the person load and unload until it fits just right? Says the Talmud, even up to a hundred times, you load it, it doesn't really fit properly, you unload it. You try again, you try again, you try again. Even a hundred times, you must not abandon him. You must not let him on his own. You have to ensure that you are there to help him get the animal situated properly and loaded properly. Now, the Talmud actually even adds that after it's loaded properly, you should accompany him along his journey the length of a parsa, a parsing, 
just to make sure that it's all fitting properly and it's not going to collapse after, you know, 100 feet. And until the owner tells you, okay, it looks like it's good, only then are you relieved of your mitzvah. Now, what if the owner's not around? You just see a random animal struggling with the weight. You would be obligated to help unload the animal, position the cargo properly, even if you don't know who the owner is. But what about if the owner is there? And the owner is a clever little individual. And he says, aha, you have a mitzvah to help me. So I'm going to go sit down under the shade. I'm going to pull out a cigarette and start smoking. And I'm going to watch you load my animal. Because after all, you have a mitzvah. What are you going to do? You have no choice. You got to help me. In that instance, the halacha is that you do not need to help that person. It's only when the owner is working alongside you, only then are you obligated to help the owner, unless the owner is old or too old or too frail or too dignified to do it. With the exception of that, if the owner says, I'm going to twiddle my thumbs and watch you sweat, you would not be obligated to do it. Now, regarding this entire subject, the sages talk about the general concept of treatment of animals. There is a mitzvah to not cause unnecessary pain to animals, and there is a discussion as to whether or not that is of torah Idric origin, is that a rabbinic law? Everyone agrees it's a law. The question is exactly where does it come from? Where is it sourced? Some suggest that this mitzvah that tells us that we have to help the animal in distress, help the animal in its burden, that may be a source for this mitzvah. Now, the Talmud, the book of Amitzia, page 85a, tells us that the great Rabbi Judah, the prince, had 13 years of terrible pains. He had scurvy, he had kidney stones, awful, awful pain and suffering. And the reason, says the Talmud, the reason for this is because there was an incident. What was the incident? There was a calf, so a small cow that was being led to the slaughterhouse. And the the butcher and the shokh at the ritual slaughter was carrying this animal, or taking this animal, and the animal was very, very petrified, very scared. And it went to Rabbi Judah the Prince and tried to snuggle underneath his garment to try to kind of get protection. The animal obviously had a sense that its hours were numbered and it was looking for protection. And it went and snuggles under the garment of the great rabbi. And the great rabbi tells the animal, you must go to be slaughtered. That is why God created you. And since the great rabbi was a little bit flippant in the lack of empathy towards the pain of the animal, That's why it was decreed from heaven that he is going to suffer physically. And for 13 years, he had miserable and horrific suffering. And the Talmud actually gives a very graphic illustration of his pain that he went through. And then, 13 years later, the maidservant of Rabbi Judah the Prince was sweeping his house and found some vermin on the corner of the house. And the great rabbi says, just let the animals be. Don't don't, don't cause pain to the animals. Let them stay there. And because he showed compassion to the animals, his pains went away. The Almighty decreed, okay, it's enough. He suffered enough. The pains went away. And this is an illustration of the seriousness through which we are told that we must maintain the the or we we must be empathetic to the pain of animals even though an animal does not have free will even though an animal is lower than man even though we do wear leather and we do eat meat and there's nothing ethically or halakhically wrong with that we believe that the animals were created for our benefit nevertheless we're supposed to try to develop that sense of of mercy and kindness and benevolence and empathy with the pain of others, even the pain of animals. And that's the grave lesson being conveyed over here. As an aside, 
Maybe this should be edited out of the podcast. Maybe this should be uh, an exclusive for those of y'all that are here. I don't know. You let me know afterwards. The Kabbalists, they talk about what was actually happening in this episode of Rabbi Judah the Prince and the calf that snuggled underneath his garment. And the Kabbalists ask a question, wait a minute, a bovine, a baby calf, what do they know about what's happening? How, how could they possibly know that he's being led to the slaughterhouse? How could he know that? What is the meaning of this animal snuggling underneath the garments of the great Rabbi Judah the Prince? So the Kabbalists say that actually this calf contained a spark of the soul of a very righteous man. And this righteous man was reincarnated or part of a soul was reincarnated into the animal. And there was some flaw that needed to be fixed that was going to be fixed with this animal being led to the slaughter. And this person was righteous in general, but there was something missing, and therefore part of the person's soul, whatever that means, again, this is very advanced stuff, part of the person's soul tumbled and was reincarnated into this animal, and the way it was going to be fixed, the way that spiritual flaw was going to be fixed, was via the slaughtering. And when this calf began to snuggle underneath the garment of Rabbi Judah the Prince, what this spark, this soul was actually trying to do was trying to get the great rabbi to fix the spiritual flaw in the soul and thereby avoiding the necessity of the soul going through the process of slaughtering. How that works, I have no earthly clue, but apparently the great Kabbalists were able to discern the bad story and the history of souls, not only human souls, but even sparklets of souls, whatever that means, that were present in other things. And they're able to kind of manually fix those problems. So the great Rabbi of the Prince, if anyone knew how to do it, he would know how to do it. He was being requested by this soul, come fix my problem so I could avoid the going through the process of, of being slaughtered. And of course, Rabbi Judah the Prince understood that. And he said to the soul, wait a minute, if in heaven they decided that you must be reincarnated into this calf, so you should suffer whatever pain you suffer via the slaughtering to fix the flaw, who am I to intervene? And maybe that was the flaws, or that was the that was the actual spiritual background of that of that episode. Even though, of course, on the surface, it, it seems like Rabbi Judah the Prince is not showing compassion for the animal. Maybe there's something deeper going on, as the Kabbalists suggest. Now, of course, we don't know anything about reincarnation or how this works or sparklets of souls. We don't know anything about that, but it is very interesting. And when I saw this last night, I said, "You know what? This is something." which is really interesting. Maybe we'll leave in the podcast and whoever listens all the way to the end will be able to get a little little dose of uh, interesting uh, interesting commentary. Okay, so we have this concept to not cause any pain to animals. However, there is a very important principle and that is that man comes first. Whenever there's a question of the agenda of man conflicting with the agenda of the animal, we believe that man is higher on the spiritual totem pole and therefore in the hierarchy of value of creations, man is above animal. So we have to do whatever we can to help the animal. If we see an animal distress, we try to save it. If we, if we must cause pain to the animal, we make it as minimal as possible. But if there is an instance where it's, our interest, or even our comfort conflicting with the life of the animal, we're even allowed to kill the animal. So there's no halakhic problem to kill bugs and mosquitoes, for example, unless it's Shabbos, that would be a violation of Shabbos. Smashing spiders with shoes, an activity that we have to do a lot here in Canada in this uh, little cottage slash cabin that we're in. Crawling with spiders, you got to always smash them with the uh, slippers. That's okay. Why? Because if it is a nuisance to you, you're 
comfort takes priority. Pest control, completely permissible, not a problem. Now, hunting for sport, is that okay? So there's a very famous responsa written by the No de Behuda. The No de Behuda was one of the great rabbis of uh, recent centuries. And someone said, are you let her go hunt for sport? So you're going to shoot animals and you're not even eating them. It's not like you're eating them, trapping them, eating them. It's not like you're benefiting from them in a tangible way, but you're enjoying the experience. It's, it's part of the sport. Is that okay? So he says unequivocally, the prohibition against causing pain to animals is only when there's no benefit for you. But to kill the animals, to shoot the deer, whatever it is, for sport, you are benefiting from it. You're getting pleasure out of it. And therefore, it's okay, halakhically. However, he concludes, the whole thing is mysterious to me. In the Torah, the only hunters we find are Esav and Nimrod, two of the villains, of course, in the story. And this is not the ways of the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's saying it's not a Jewish pastime. This is not a Jewish pastime. We can find better ways to spend our time than this, but technically it would be permissible. A few more interesting laws. The Talmud tells us that you are not allowed to eat before you feed your animals. So suppose you have a pet or you have um, you have a farm with some animals. You must feed your animals before you eat yourself. And quotes a verse, you first give grass in the field for your animals and only then do you eat and you are satiated. So this is again a similar idea that we must show compassion for the animals and we must develop our own character and if you have an animal that you're in charge of that you are tending to that uh, you are a steward over you must feed the animal before you yourself eat. Again, uh, the sages tell us that for your own benefit you can indeed use the animal So another example given here is if you need a quill, you're allowed to pluck feathers off an animal, not a problem. It causes pain to the animal, but you know what? For your benefit, it is okay. But to cause any unnecessary pain for an animal, uh, to tie the legs of an animal together in a way that causes them pain, to force a bird to sit on edge of a different species, that would be considered prohibited. The Sefer Chinuch, the book that we're using to guide us through the mitzvahs, in mitzvah number 451, please God, we'll get to it soon, the mitzvah of slaughtering an animal to make it kosher, he points out that the way kosher slaughtering is done actually kills the animal very fast and minimizes the pain of the animal. And part of the mitzvah, part of the idea behind the mitzvah, the way we're supposed to process it, is that we're not going to cause unnecessary pain for the animal. And that's perhaps a reason why the Almighty told us to slaughter it in that particular fashion. In addition, there's another mitzvah related to this, and that is the prohibition against muzzling an animal as it is plowing. If you have an animal that's plowing your field, and of course there's there's fruits, there's vegetables, vegetation in the air, you're not allowed to muzzle the animal as it's plowing. You have to allow it to munch along some of the produce along the way as it is plowing. One final point that I want to stress, and that is the question of vegetarianism. What is the Torah's perspective on vegetarianism? So the answer is, it is totally fine. There is only one instance where you would be required to eat meat as a mitzvah, and that is the question of sacrifices. If we have a temple rebuilt, please God, we'll have it rebuilt and we'll restore sacrifices. Every year comes along Pesach and every Jew is required to eat the equivalent of an olive's volume of the carbon Pesach, the pastoral offering, And therefore, it's a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah from the Torah, to eat from that animal, and that would be the one mitzvah that mandates the consumption of meat. Besides for that, or certainly today in our world, there's no mitzvah to eat meat. If you want to be a vegetarian, no problem whatsoever. In fact, my grandfather, blessed memory, he himself was a vegetarian. However, to say that someone is a vegetarian because of ethical reasons is a philosophical misnomer. Because again, like we said earlier, we believe that the Almighty created the world for us. The purpose of creation is fulfilled by humanity. Not by the angels who are more lofty spiritually than us. Not by the animals who are less lofty spiritually than us. For us. 
and the angels and the animals and everything, the entire arena of the world is there to service us. And the animals are there to service us. We are the purpose of creation, not them. And therefore, the Almighty gave us animals, gave us a cow. Why? To mow the lawn, to give us leather, to give us succulent beef. That's why cows were created, for our benefit. We can use it for our pleasure. We can eat them, no problem. So again, there's nothing wrong with being a vegetarian, but when someone is a vegetarian because they don't want to cause pain to animals, or who am I to eat the animal, that conflicts with our understanding of creation and and the fact that not all creations are created equal. Humanity is the purpose of creation. Adam is the purpose of creation. A human bearing free will is the purpose of creation and nothing else. And therefore, the animal is there to service us. We can enjoy it. And there's no ethical problem of consuming it, of wearing leather, of wearing fur. It's not a problem whatsoever. You want to be vegetarian because of health reasons or something. You happen to not like meat. Not a problem. Enjoy your quinoa and kale. No problem. Get your uh, get your protein. Get your, enjoy your tofu. No problem whatsoever. Just don't assume that that is ethically in line with what the Torah says. Okay, so that's the mitzvah, mitzvah number 80, 540, 541, the mitzvah to help your friend load and unload the animal, and the prohibition against ignoring that, and more broadly, we spoke about Torah's perspective on treating animals with uh, with respect and uh, not causing them any pain, unnecessary pain, and the understanding of the relationship, so to speak, between humans and the creation and and the other creations in the world and how the Almighty designed it all to operate. I thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Rabbi is spelled with two Bs, so rabbit minus the T. Walby is W-O-L-B as in buster, as in boy, as in bravo. E as in echo at gmail.com. Of course, you know that I work for Torch, torchweb.org. Check out all the amazing podcasts that we have. Parsha Podcast has just completed an entire cycle of the weekly Parshas, Jewish History Podcast, Torah 101, enjoy all of them, Ethics Podcast, Jewish Life, amazing stuff that we have for you at Torch. Thank you for listening. Until next time, this was tons of fun.